Okay, um, today we are going to talk about uh, changes in crystal structure or changes in the orientation of crystals which either cause a deformation or a deformation causing the change. Okay, so sometimes when we get a change in crystal orientation, we actually get a physical deformation, a change in the shape of the sample. And when that happens without changing the crystal structure, that's called twinning. And when the crystal structure actually changes during deformation, we call it martensitic transformation. So I'll go through both of these cases individually. Now, you're all familiar with slip deformation in which we have some sort of a, a crystalline material and we displace it through a distance which is a lattice vector. Okay, a lattice vector means that you go from one lattice point to the other lattice point so that you don't actually see any change in crystal structure when you translate by one lattice point, okay? Because the environment at every lattice point is identical. So here is a case where we shear this crystal and we displace the top half from the bottom half by a lattice vector. So although we've created a slip step, that's a deformation, there's absolutely no change in structure or orientation. So this is ordinary slip in which the movement of a dislocation whose Burgers vector is a lattice vector causes no change whatsoever other than creating the deformation. Okay? You are very familiar with this kind of deformation. And this is the other kind of deformation which you may not be familiar with, where instead of simply causing a slip step, translating one part of the crystal with respect to the other, you reorient the crystal such that this region becomes a reflection of the region underneath. So this has exactly the same crystal structure as the bottom half, but it's reoriented by this deformation. We've created a twin, which if you reflect about the twin plane, you see this point is exactly this point through, reflected through that red plane, this point is this one, and so on. So we've deformed the crystal by an amount which leads to a reorientation so that it's in a mirror orientation with respect to the lower half. And that's called mechanical twinning. And you can see that this is effectively a shear. We've taken this and sheared it through that angle. Okay? So that's twinning. <clears throat> and when you take your single crystal and you create a twin, and let's imagine there's nothing else surrounding this particular single crystal. It's just pushing against air. Then you will change the shape of your sample as follows. You're, you're shearing the crystal. Okay? And the magnitude of that shear will determine shortly, but it's very, very large. This is the largest sort of deformation that you get in crystalline materials. And the plane on which that shear occurs is called the twin plane. And the direction in which the shear occurs is the twinning direction. Now, this is a kind of deformation which, like slip deformation, doesn't require any diffusion. So it can happen at very low temperatures. There's, uh, you're simply moving all the atoms in a very disciplined way in the same direction at the same time to create the twinned region. So let's imagine we have a, a cubic F crystal, and we are looking at the closed back planes here. So you remember that in a cubic closed back material, the 111 planes, which are the closed back planes, are stacked in a sequence A, B, C, A, B, C. Do you remember that? Yeah. So they're stacked in a sequence A, B, C, A, B, C. And what we are going to do is displace the layer, one of the layers, so that it moves from an A hole to a B hole. And we'll see how the stacking sequence actually changes. So here we are. We, th this is our starting configuration where here we have a stacking A, B, C, A, B, C, and so on. And then I translate this layer from an A position to a B position. And you can see that we've got a different sequence now, A, B, C, B and that this layer is a reflection of this layer about the twin plane. Okay. So twinning involves the translation of a closed-packed layer, every single closed-packed layer, 
from an A position to a B position, or a B position to a C position, or a C position to an A position, okay, so on. If I do this translation on every single layer, I will create this twin crystal, okay? So what we are doing is creating above this region another uh, cubic closed back layer, but it will be in an orientation which is reflected about this twin plane. Now, we, we know from this diagram the spacing of this plane, okay? All we have to do is determine the distance between an A hole and a B hole on the closed back layer to calculate the magnitude of the shear. So the magnitude of the shear will be that displacement from A to B divided by the spacing of the 111 planes. So this is how a closed back layer looks like. You know, the atoms are touching along three directions, and those three directions are the closed back directions, which are the 110 type directions in a cubic closed back crystal. So for example, this is a 110 type direction, that's a 110 type direction, and so is this. And I've drawn in one of those 110 directions. A is the lattice parameter of, of our crystal. So if I, if I go from this position, which is a, uh, a C site, to another C site, I don't change anything, okay, because that's a lattice vector. If I displace the crystal by a lattice vector, I don't actually change anything in the structure. So in order to create a twin, which is a different orientation, I have to displace by a vector which is not a lattice vector, okay? So here you see, if I go from this C position to a B position, uh, then that distance is A upon six, two, one, one, and that will change the stacking sequence, okay? Because we are now translating from a B, uh, C position to a B position. And similarly, this is another such translation. So if I take that distance here, which will create my twin, okay? So I shear through A upon six, two, one, one, and I divide it by the spacing of the 111 planes, then I get the magnitude of the twinning shear. And that, if you, if you work out the magnitude of this, it's A upon root six. If you work out the despacing, it's A upon root three. And that gives my shear as one over root two, or approximately 0 0.7071. Okay, one over root two is just 0 0.7071. It's a huge shear. Very, very large here. So that's a strain of 0.7. So 1 over root 2 is approximately 0 0.7071. Now, just to give you an idea of how large that shear is, can you tell me a typical value of an elastic strain? Say I have a, a, a modulus of 200 gigapascals and a stress of 200 megapascals, okay? What is the magnitude of the elastic shear, uh, elastic strain? Yeah. So I've got a stress of 200 megapascals and an elastic modulus which is 200 gigapascals. What is the value of the strain? 10 to the minus 3, that's correct. So this is the value of an elastic strain, and this is the twinning shear. So that's a, a massive shear, and it will cause a lot of strain energy when it happens inside a constrained system. By a constrained system, what I mean is that if, if the crystal is surrounded by thousands of other crystals, it's not completely free to change its shape. Okay, so when we form a twin inside a polycrystalline material, there will be a huge amount of strain energy as it pushes against all the other crystals. So it will adopt a shape which minimizes that strain energy. So this, this is uh, a thin plate shape which is sharp at the ends, okay? Now the reason why it's sharp at the ends is as follows. Why does that help to minimize strain energy? So imagine that I'm starting with this, okay? And I twin it. So there's a shear 
of 1 upon root 2. Now, the strain, of course, is the same everywhere, the shear strain. But you can see that the displacement here is larger, and it gets smaller and smaller as I approach this twin plane. So if I make my plate very, very thin, then the displacement here is reduced. So by making the plate very, th uh, making the twin very thin, I actually reduce the strain energy. Okay. And that's why a mechanical twin will always look like this, which is a lens shape. Okay. In three dimensions, it's like a lens with a very sharp tip at the end, because then the displacement is minimal. OK? Everyone happy with that explanation? Yeah, if, you, if you look at this, clearly, this, the magnitude of this arrow decreases as I go towards the twin plane. So if I make my tip over here extremely sharp, that displacement is more or less 0. Okay. So it's favorable for this to be a very thin plate. So whenever you see in the microstructure a lens-shaped object, that really is to minimize strain energy. Okay? And if it is twinning, then you can identify it by a shape like this. Now, of course, the twin plane itself has perfect coherency because it's the same plane. You know, we are just changing the stacking sequence about that plane. Okay? So the twin interface will have a very low energy. And supposing that I grow a crystal, which happens to be in twin orientation with another crystal. Okay, so I haven't produced it by mechanical deformation, but I grow it so that it happens to be in twin orientation. Then there is no strain energy. Yeah, they have just simply grown by assembling atoms uh, in a, uh, allowing diffusion to happen. And then the twin doesn't have to have sharp ends. So it will look something like this, simply because the interfacial energy here is low, but it will not have sharp tips at the end. So this just happens to be in twin orientation with this region, because that's the way in which it has grown. And those are known as annealing twins, and they do not have any deformation associated with them. It's just like producing any two crystals in any orientation. Here you happen to produce them in twin orientation. Okay. So these are called annealing twins, because when you severely deform particular metals, and you recrystallize them, you're growing new grains, and you happen to get some grains which are in twin orientation, they're not deformations, they're simply growing in that orientation. Okay? So those are called annealing twins, and you can easily distinguish them by looking at them. So for example, can you guess what this is? Is it a mechanical twin or an annealing twin? Any ideas? What feature of that twin would you look at to identify it as a mechanical twin? Sharp tips. Look at that. Yeah. So these are mechanical twins. Of course, if you polished this sample completely flat, okay, mirror finish, and then you twinned it, you would also see the displacement of the surface when the twin forms. Okay? Because a mechanical twin is a deformation just like um, slip. In slip, you see slip steps. Here, you would see the shear. Now, I'm going to also show you a demonstration uh, where I'm bending a piece of indium. Uh, indium is a metal. And mechanical twinning doesn't require any diffusion because, uh, you know, it's a disciplined movement of atoms. Uh, so sometimes we call it this a military transformation. They all move in concert. Okay. So it can happen extremely rapidly. And just like sometimes we get a latent heat of transformation, you can release that energy by sound emission. Okay. So sometimes when you bend metals which twin, you can actually hear the twinning happening. And this has been noticed most frequently in, metal, uh, in tin. So it's known as a tin cry. But I'm going to show you for a metal called indium. And indium has this structure. It's a body-centered tetragonal structure. Now, usually when you deform a metal, 
it prefers to deform by slip because there are many, many slip systems available. For example, in cubic close packed, you have 24 different slip systems. Okay? So slip is easier than twinning. But if you have a crystal structure which is complicated and doesn't have many easy slip systems, then it prefers to deform by twinning. And this is a, a tetragonal eye uh, lattice, and it's a crystal structure which is tetragonal eye. It doesn't have many slip systems, and it prefers to deform by mechanical twinning. And when it does that, it emits sound. So first of all, I'll show you uh, that I'm actually bending this sample of indium. Okay. And now I'll sort of show you a sound file which has better quality of the twins. Yeah. See that? So as I, as I bend the piece of indium, I'm getting that snap, crackle and pop, which is not the material cracking up, but it's mechanical twinning happening inside the metal. So this is uh, commonly known as the tin cry. Because you take a piece of tin and you bend it, you will get the same effect. Okay. So when a crystal structure change happens extremely rapidly, it can emit sound. So some of the energy is dissipated by emission of sound, just like sometimes we dissipate energy in the form of heat. So you can hear audible clicks. And there's nothing wrong with the structure of the metal. There are no cracks forming inside the metal. So twinning tends to happen when the crystal structure is complicated. It doesn't have too much symmetry, so slip becomes difficult. Or when we deform the material at an extremely high strain rate, so dislocations, ordinary dislocations, don't have time to respond to the applied stress. So for example, if we put a bit of explosive and blow up a piece of metal, ordinarily it would deform by slip. But when you have an explosion, you will be able to pick up twins inside your metal, mechanical twins. Okay. This, by contrast, is an annealing twin. And you can see that it doesn't actually have any sharp tips at the end. And I showed you this same micrograph when we were discussing recrystallization. So this is all deformed material. This is a new grain growing. And this just happens to be two new grains growing, which are in twin orientation with respect to each other. Okay. So no sharp, no deformation, no sharp tips. This is zinc. And do you know what the crystal structure of zinc is? Why isn't zinc you know, a, a major metal in engineering applications? The biggest use we have for it is to protect steel by galvanizing. Yeah. We don't use it for engineering applications as zinc. It has a crystal structure, which is hexagonal close-packed. And you know that in some hexagonal close-packed metals, the only slip system you have is the basal plane. Yeah. So three slip systems. And that's not enough to give you ductility in a metal. So when you deform zinc, Again, it deforms by mechanical twinning, and you can see the sharp tips at the ends of the twins. This is a, a piece of metal, which a uh, piece of steel, a ferrite perlite steel, which I, I blew up using plastic, sec plastic explosives about 20 years ago. Okay? This was, of course, done in very controlled conditions, and you can see mechanical twins. If you deform steel ordinarily, you will not get these twins. It will deform by slip. Okay? So you can use this for forensic evidence. You know, sometimes it's not clear whether, you know, when you have a, a crash or something um, and loss of fire, whether there has been a bomb there or not. You can examine the metallography and look at the strain rate of the deformation because this, when you blow something up, it's a very high strain rate deformation. And you can pick up mechanical twinning. So mechanical twinning tends to happen in systems where there are few, few slip systems available. So zinc, for example, is hexagonal, close-packed. Tin is tetragonal. 
and I showed you indium, which is also uh, tetragonal I. Uh, high strain rates, because twinning can occur very, very rapidly. The speed of sound in a metal is typically about 5,000 meters per second. So it can easily accommodate that sort of a strain rate. Now, we can actually design a steel so that instead of slipping, it will deform by twinning. Yeah? This is the very, very latest research where we are looking at alloys of extremely heavily alloyed iron. Okay, so here we have 25 atomic percent or weight percent of manganese. And the research here is not just happening in universities, but there are huge research programs in industry because in this, the deformation mostly happens by mechanical twinning. And the properties that you get are quite remarkable. You know, it starts off at a very low strength. So th this, for a steel, this is an extremely low strength or something of the order of three or 400 megapascals. And as you stretch it, it work hardens to something like 1,200 megapascals. That's 1 1.2 gigapascals, extremely strong. And you can get strains of the order of 100% elongation. Now, you can imagine that you want a material like this because when you start to form a component, you want it to be weak. But when you finally finished forming the component, you want it to be extremely strong. So there's lots and lots of uh, quite commercially confident, uh, co confident programs going on in industry to use this steel to make the next generation of cars much safer and much lighter. Because if you have this level of strength, then you can reduce the thicknesses of the components that go into car and reduce the weights of car. Now, in your notes, I gave you a table showing the different components of, I think I might have it here. No, I don't. Uh, showing you the weight of a car back in uh, some years ago and a modern car. And you've seen that there is a considerable reduction in the weight of the car because uh, of the advances in materials. And that's very good because, you know, we want to save fuel. However, the weight of a car is now increasing because of safety regulations. You know, you've got to protect the car from side impact, uh, uh, you know, when you have a crash from the side and so on. And these regulations are very important because we want to keep you safe inside the car. And look at this, how much energy it actually absorbs during deformation. It's a huge amount of energy. So you want materials which absorb energy during crash. And we want to keep the weight down. And that is the reason for developing new metallic alloys. Of course, it would help if everybody used reasonably small cars. Now, the twinning part of uh, this lecture deals really with a reorientation of the crystal, but there's no actual crystal structure change. The crystal structure of the twin is exactly the same as the crystal structure of the matrix. It's simply in a different orientation. But there is a phase transformation called martensite, which actually leads to a change in crystal structure and causes a deformation. And I'm going to illustrate that using uh, the cubic closed pack and the hexagonal closed pack systems because it's very easy to understand. Cubic closed pack, these are the closed pack layers and they are in a sequence ABC, ABC. Yeah, so the stacking sequence is ABC, ABC. And you, you've got this diagram in your notes, but it's not colored and it doesn't have all these atoms. It just shows you the change in crystal structure. Here we have a different stacking sequence, which is AB, AB, AB. Okay. So it's obvious how to go from cubic closed pack to hexagonal closed pack. If I shift every second layer here by a distance A upon 6, 1, 1, 2, as I showed you in a previous slide, by every second layer, then I change the stacking sequence from this to this. And I've changed the crystal structure, and I've also caused a deformation, okay? Because it's, it's a shear when I shift these atomic layers by a distance A upon 6, 1, 1, 2. So can you tell me, will the shear deformation in this be smaller or greater than that in twinning? So in twinning, we had 1 over square root of 2. We shifted every layer by a distance a upon 6, 1, 1, 2. 
here we are shifting every second layer. It's smaller because uh, it's now two one, one, uh, one planes. If you, if you go back to that small calculation that we did, here, to calculate the shear deformation involved in the martensitic transformation of cubic close back to hexagonal close back, you have to put 2D111 over here. So this obviously will be smaller. It'll be 1 over root 8 instead of 1 over root 2. Okay? So the twinning shear is actually much bigger than the shear that you get in martensitic transformations, and that's generally true, not just for the CCP to HCP transformation. Even when we look at CCP to body-centered cubic trans transformation, it will still be the same. A small, smaller shear than 1 upon root 2. Everyone happy with the mechanism of this transformation? Yeah? Simply shifting every second layer by a distance a upon 6, 1, 1, 2. Now, just to give you a hint, um, you know, if you want to decompose a lattice vector like that into, you know, a upon 6, 1, 1, 2, then you simply write that as a upon 6, and where you have a 1, you put a 2, 1, 1, okay, plus a by 6, 1, 2, bar 1. Bar 1 because here we have a 0. Okay? So that's a vector sum which represents this. Yeah, you can see here that this plus this equals this. Okay? So the 2 comes where the 1 is, and this and this must add up to 0. Okay, so this is just a, another illustration of the same thing. On this side, we have ABC, ABC stacking, and by shifting the layers, I've now created a, a thin region of HCP phase here. And of course, the 111 plane, which is the close back plane of CCP, will be exactly parallel to the basal plane of the HCP, the 0001. Are you familiar with the four index notation? Okay, so just cancel out this index here, okay, and write it as 0, 0, 001. Don't, don't worry about this, okay? Don't worry about the four index notation. The basal plane of the hexagonal system is clear to you, okay? And of course, the shear is in this direction here. Now, whereas it's straightforward to see how to go from CCP to HCP. It isn't when I want to go from CCP here to body-centered cubic. How can I deform the face-centered or uh, cubic close-back structure, uh, which we call austenite, into the body-centered cubic structure, ferrite? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw two cubic close-back cells next to each other. So this is our cubic close back cell, and I want to change it into this body-centered cubic cell. And I've done nothing here except draw two, face, uh, two cubic close back cells next to each other. OK? Now, inside that drawing, and without doing any crystal structure change, I'm simply going to redefine the cell there, because, you know, if I have a set of points, then I'm free to choose my lattice. Okay, this unit cell is nice and it reflects the symmetry of the cell, but I could equally well have chosen that as my cell. All I need to do is take this and stack it in three dimensions to reproduce the set of points. But we choose the unit cell, which is most convenient 
from the point of view of reflecting the symmetry of the pattern and so on. But I can actually uh, choose an infinite number of unit cells to represent the same set of points. And that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to choose a new unit cell to represent this structure. So instead of this uh, face-centered cubic, I've drawn in here a body-centered tetragonal cell to represent the same set of points. Okay? So this, this is perfectly reasonable to do. It doesn't give us everything about the symmetry of the lattice points because it's obvious that in a cube, you know, uh, that set of points is best represented by a cube. But this will do it equally well. So I've just redrawn the unit cell of cubic closed packed as a body-centered tetragonal cell. Is everyone happy with that? Okay. Now, is it clear how I can do a deformation which changes that into body-centered cubic? Yeah, all I have to do is compress along the z-axis and expand along these two directions, yeah, squash that cell, and I've got body-centered cubic. Okay. So I can change the cubic close pack cell into body-centered cubic by a physical deformation. In other words, if that transformation happens without diffusion, then I will get martensite, which is body-centered cubic. Okay. This is known as the Bain strain. So it's uh, squashing the cell along the z-axis and expanding uniformly along the other two axes to get the body-centered cell. And once again, you see, martensite will have sharp tips because there will be strain energy when you form it in a constrained environment, just like mechanical twinning. When you look at plates of martensite, they will always have very sharp tips at the end because that is the shape which minimizes the strain energy. So these are, this is how you would see martensite in a sample of steel. Very, very thin plates. Of course, we are looking at cross-sections here. The three-dimensional shape is that of a lens, okay, a very thin lens. So martensite will always be in the form of thin plates with sharp tips. And here we have a system of deformation. It's a mechanism of deformation which also changes the crystal structure. That's the definition of martensite. So it's a mechanism of deformation which also changes the crystal structure. If I take a specimen of the parent phase and polish it completely flat, then I transform it to martensite, you will see the surface upheavals because of the shears. And this is not an etched specimen. Here we are looking at an interference micrograph which basically shows you the tilting of the surface. And you can see that the martensite plates have caused the surface to tilt. Okay? So this, the shears that we talk about and the deformations which change CCP into um, body-centered cubic are real deformations. Okay? But they change the crystal structure. Now, of course, we can use this to advantage. Yeah? We can... We can uh, we can cause the phase transformation to reverse and therefore reverse the change in shape. Yeah? This is the basis of the shape memory alloys which you might have come across. So here we have our parent phase which I call gamma. And you, you make that parent phase in a particular shape that you desire. So for example, if you want to make you know, spectacle frames, you make it in the shape of the parent phase at a high temperature. When it cools, it transforms into a whole cluster of martensite plates. And those martensite plates form in such a way that they accommodate each other's deformation so that the overall shape does not change. Okay. Then, you know, you accidentally bend your uh, spectacle frames. When you do that, the martensite plates exchange their deformations with each other to accommodate your bending. So that's a permanent change in shape. But if I now heat this, I go back to my original shape, and when it cools, you recovered your original shape. So your spectacle frames. So don't do this on your frames if they're not shape memory frames, okay? Um, 
so if you, if you make your uh, component out of shape memory metal and you damage it, you can recover the shape. Okay? So I'm going to give you a, a little demonstration to illustrate all the features of the shape memory uh, metal. And although it's a, it's a fun demonstration, it contains everything about shape memory metals that I want to illustrate. Okay? So I just need to heat up some water. While the water is heating up, I'll show you one other application. Yeah, it's a pretty gory looking photograph. But you know, when you go to the dentist to get your teeth straightened out and you put braces, you have to go back periodically to get them tightened up. Yeah, because as your teeth adjust to close the gaps and so on, the dentist has to tighten up the braces. If you use this stuff, the shape memory metal braces, then as your teeth shrink, they get, the braces get tighter. Okay? Because they are under stress, and um, as your teeth relax, the strain from the changes in crystal structure accommodates that. So they automatically tighten. So you don't need to go back to the dentist except when you want to remove this. Okay? Now, when, when we um, make devices out of shape memory, alloys, what we are doing is reversing the transformation. Okay? And every time we reverse the transformation, you will create some defects. So this memory of the original shape will not last forever. If you reverse the transformation many, many times, you will tend to lose the memory because as you create defects, the interface between the parent and product phases finds it difficult to move. So if you reverse it many times, and it depends on your alloy system, with the most famous shape memory alloy, which is made out of nickel titanium, you can reverse millions of times without any problems. But if it is made out of copper aluminum alloys, then it might only reverse, say, a hundred times. And there was actually a company in Cambridge which made devices to open greenhouse windows, but they made it out of copper aluminum. And of course, they stopped working you know, after a while, and the company went bankrupt. Okay, so it's important to understand the limitations of shape memory alloys. <clears throat> okay, so I want you to use your imagination, okay? And uh, tell me what this looks like. Imagine that this, these ends are actually closed up like this, okay? What does it look like? Come on, be bold. Hard, okay? So what I'm going to do is, uh, I made this yesterday, okay? So I don't know if it's going to work, but let's see. I'm going to now break this heart. I'm going to crush it. So this now, if, if I go back to this uh, slide, what I've done is, is this step of operation. Because yesterday I heated up this wire, I produced the heart shape while it was red hot, and allowed it to cool, and of course the heart shape is retained. Now what do you do to heal a broken heart? <laughs> Boiling water, <laughs> okay. So hopefully this works. You can see there's some recovery there, okay? It's gone back to its heart shape. Now, if I break this heart too often, it will not heal. Okay? That's, that's the defects that we are creating every time we break it. Okay. And when I break it, if I put such a lot of strain that I, I go beyond this single crystal form, then it will not recover. Because if I deform it beyond this stage, then I'm doing ordinary plastic deformation, okay? So there's a critical strain beyond which you must not deform shape memory alloys, otherwise they will not reform 
Perfectly. So although this is, you know, this is a fun example, it captures absolutely everything. When you break the heart, if you give it too much pain, it will not recover. Okay? Okay, good. And just in case that demonstration didn't work, here you are. Yep. One, two, and three. <laughs> okay, we'll finish uh, off there today. If you have any questions, please ask. Okay. <clears throat>